What's happening, everybody? Welcome into a brand new episode of Crossed Up. I'm Bob Wankel. Anthony Sanfilippo is here. It's a Monday morning. Phillies lose two out of three to the Boston Red Sox. But if you're looking for a silver lining, it is that they finally snapped a six-game losing streak on Sunday with a 6-1 victory. Tywon Walker threw the baseball well. And help the Phillies, Anthony, snap their longest losing streak since June of 2019. So we'll come into this episode this morning with, a, I guess, a little bit of, I don't know, a little bit of optimism. But it's been an ugly run for this team. Yeah. And and, and I think we'll get into a little bit later why it's it's not, it shouldn't be doom and gloom. Um, Because really the rest of, with other other than the, Braves and Dodgers, the rest of the National League has kind of done the same thing as the Phillies. Uh, <laughs> um, but at the same time, yeah, you can't lose six straight games in the way that they lost them. Like if you're if you're in, in a middle, look, losing streaks happen, right? They had, I believe last year, I think they had three five-game losing streaks, right? So, I mean, you can have losing streaks of this length and it not be the, you know, the end of the world. But you can't have them happen where you're getting your pitching is getting pummeled night in and night out. Your offense does not drive in runners in scoring position. They don't. They don't. They leave men on base left, right, and center. Where you're making defensive mistakes out the wazoo. Where you're getting thrown out on the bases. Like these are the these are fundamental problems that the Phillies were having prior to Sunday. Um, and, and those look, they're going to happen. It's, it's part of baseball, but they can't happen with consistency and repeatedly uh, multiples in multiples in the same game. And that's, and that's ultimately why you lose six straight games. And look, they played two good teams, right? I mean, Dodgers are, are really good. The Red Sox were hot. I don't buy the Red Sox yet. I mean, I, their pitching is to me is not good enough, but their, their lineup was really good and, and had been hitting. So you have to do something against these teams. And, and uh, yeah, I mean, it was just, just just not a good week for the Phillies. Nevertheless, if, if you if you kind of go back and look at it and say, all right, maybe if they got the one in L.A. that they blew, this isn't as horrible an outcome as you think, and it's uh, whatever. But, I mean, it, it, we can only keep doing those kinds of lookbacks and, and, hey, let's stay positives for so long i mean it's still may we have we got plenty of time they're only what two games behind the padres with the playoff spot right so they're not far behind so you know you pump the brakes still but at the same time they're missing opportunities to to put themselves in a comfortable position as opposed to being where they were last year chasing the last wild card spot at the end of the year so i mean that's that's why it's frustrating and that's why it's disappointing yeah i think you know obviously we're going to dive into this on a on a a deeper level here throughout the course of the show, but there's a couple things that I wake up this morning and I assess this thing through 35 games. And I say, there is just no excuse to be below 500 to be three games below 500 right now with the schedule that they had in April. I don't care that Bryce Harper wasn't here. I don't care that Ranger Suarez has been out. You had a chance to really take advantage of it. Now to their credit, they got through April. They were a game above. And then May has been a mess. And you've spoke about a lot of the problems at a a higher level. But I just think it's a shame almost. I don't really even know how else to say. You're getting the crowds. You're getting the buy-in from the fans. You you were there both uh, Friday and Saturday night covering the game. I covered the game yesterday. Crowd was awesome. You're, You're getting what you want, right? But the players right now aren't holding up their end of the deal. And mm-hmm. I have to tell you, and I've, I've banged this drum for multiple weeks on this show, and I said it when they started 0-4 or 1-5, and and I'm going to say it again now. I, I see it every day. I, I see prominent Philadelphia radio hosts tweet this. This idea that the, the Mets were 10 and a half games ahead of the Braves last Memorial Day, and the Braves came storming back. So the Phillies then, because they're eight games behind right now, obviously because there's a precedent, are going to be able to come storming back. Like the the, the first 35 games of the season don't matter. And to me, it's, it's like ridiculous. Like don't confuse the precedent that was established last year and assume that it's it's going to be likely that the same thing occurs this year. Like being behind eight games at any point on the calendar is not good. It's especially not good when you're eight games behind the overwhelming 
the overwhelming division favorite, who, by the way, is 24 and 11 right now, who's playing like almost 700 baseball over their last 147 regular season games dating back to June 1st. Like the Braves are legit. The Phillies are not playing from behind, but as a, a, as a superior team, like this all matters. Like if, if you're, if you're watching these games, like I'm not telling you the Phillies can't get back into the NL East race. I'm not saying that they, they are incapable of it, but to sit here and act like, ah, oh, well, you know, we saw what happened in the NL East last year. No big deal. Like g- give me a break. Like let's get real. You're, you're not watching a team right now that, that you feel great about and they can fix a lot of these issues that we're going to dive into. But to sit here and say that the first, six weeks of this season have have been utterly irrelevant it's wrong yeah it's it's absolutely wrong to to look at it that from that perspective I mean there are there are ways to look at it positively you know and and you sit there and and, and you say and I think we've said this in the past that you know hey if you can make up a game a week you know you're you're right back in it by you know whatever nice to stop saying that like i know if we could just play 34 games over 500 the rest of the way we can maybe chop them down like dude like how about how about not do that how about be in it right from jump street yeah no you're 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 a thousand percent correct and I'll give you another. I'll try and play spin it. I'm look. I'm gonna. I'm just gonna try and spin the positives. But you're right. I mean, you should because like I I walked out of there yesterday and I was just like, okay, you know, like I mean, yeah. Just, well, I mean, I mean, look. I mean, it is what it it, it is what it is. You've put the, put yourself in a hole, and you got to start digging, right? Um, there's plenty of time to dig, but you got to start digging now. I think I'll try and give you another positive. Look, the Braves. You're right. The Braves. Are be- look, I've been. I, I argue it year in and year. I, for three years, I've said the Braves are the best team in the, in baseball in my mind. Um, and, and again, they're in my mind. They're the best team in baseball. But you look at you look at what you got. What Atlanta's got coming up. They, they have a tough schedule. Now it's a, they're twenty four and eleven, so they're the best team. They're uh, only Tampa has a better record, and and I don't think Tampa's as good as Atlanta. But um, but nevertheless. They got to play Boston the next two nights. Well, they're off today, but they got to play Boston next two games. Boston can hit, right? So maybe there's something there. Then they have a tough six game stretch against Toronto and Texas. So their their pitching is going to be tested because they're going to face three pretty good offenses in a row. And then it's three with the Mariners, who are like the Phillies, a little bit of a disappointment right now, but they can be good. Then three with the Dodgers, and then four with the Phillies. So I mean, their their break schedule is not easy here. The next. 17 games so this is an opportunity if you look at it over the next 17 games if you're the Phillies and say hey maybe in that 17 game stretch we could pick up four games and then if you're four games back on, on Memorial Day you're oh, you're feeling pretty good right you're feeling pretty good that, but that's it, 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 what's got to be incumbent upon that and this kind of ties into what my prediction was last week we remember we were laughing about it where I said the Mets were going to utterly collapse this week Against the Tigers and Rockies, and lo and behold, what they a did. Bizarre prediction. I mean, like we should we should probably rewind that one back because you said it with such confidence, like it was a matter of fact, it was a matter of statement, it was it was going to happen. And I'm like, dude, they're they're playing the the Tigers and the Rockies this week. What the hell are you talking about? It's just just watching enough of, of, of really of all those, and I'll tell you I'll tell you why I, I was saying it uh, in a minute, but. But it's but all that did happen, and the my, my prediction ends up being wrong because the Phillies didn't hold up their end of the bargain, right? Right. So what I'm telling you is, is I think Atlanta might have a tough enough stretch here. Not that they're going to get smoked or anything like that, but they could lose a few games in the next 17. The Phillies now have to hold up their end and make up the difference. They have to do what they have to do to win those games over that same course of time. So that so that's what I'm saying. It's it's it, two things have to happen. And, and just quickly, why I picked that to happen. Do you, know, you know what the Tigers' record is against teams not in the American League East this year? Yeah, they've actually been really good. I know it's like 14 one of and three statistical anomalies. Yeah. yeah I mean, so as long as they're not playing the American League East, they've actually played good baseball. So that was one of the reasons I kind of liked them against the Mets. But other than, the, and then, I mean, the Rockies had, had been playing pretty good baseball too, which was a surprise because they stink. Um, <laughs> but, but at the same time, you know, I've been looking at the Mets and just watching the watching them play. Their their lineup is not is re- really inconsistent. They're getting no pitch. Their bullpen is terrible. And, and so it's like I've been watching them too, and I'm like, hey, this team's not going to win games. <laughs> and that's why I made the prediction that I made. But maybe I'm a little clouded because the Phillies have had similar problems, which we're going to start diving into now. And maybe my vision's a little clouded because I'm around the Phillies all the time, and you keep hearing everything's going to be fine. Don't worry about it. We're going to be okay. We're going to be okay. And you kind of b- believe them when they tell you that. 
and then every night it goes down it's and it's the same thing it's like well do, do i really believe these guys i don't know yeah well i mean i think you said it right and it is a, a two-part equation here the phillies have to hold up their end of the bargain maybe atlanta hits a little bit of a wall but you are talking about a braves team and i am very aware of what happened last october i know what happened but the braves are 102 and 45 in their last 147 regular season games that is yeah. almost 700 it's 694 baseball that they're playing over the last 147 regular season games it's pr- pr- pretty good yeah. um so the Phillies are going to have to play better baseball. And, and so what has to happen for the Phillies to play better baseball? And like, let's start right off the bat. Bryce Harper, I don't, I guess I'm surprised, but I shouldn't be. He's come back. He had one bad game to start things off. And then he just picked up right where he left off last October. The guy is absolutely unbelievable. I mean, enough. I, it's almost not even worth talking about because it's like, you just marvel at what he's been able to do. He's making adjustments in game. He's using all fields. You're seeing the powers there. I mean, it's just, it's unbelievable what he's mm-hmm. been able to do. Um, and I know that he had 50, 60, some at bats that weren't in, in game situations. They were simulated at bats. So he's gotten some timing here, but just to be able to hop right back in and produce at this level in a lineup where there's a bunch of guys not producing at all. It just, it's truly remarkable. Yeah. I mean, Harper, Harper is a, is a freak of nature. I mean, he really is. I mean, to, to watch what he's doing, uh, you know, he's a guy that I'm going to, I'm going to sit here and tell you, you, you know, you remember when he came back from the thumb injury um, and he really wasn't himself right away. I mean, it took him, took him a bit. I mean, and, and I, I think that that's a little bit different because he, he actually talked about this. Um, I guess it was out in LA where he was talking about the, the difference between coming back from a hand injury when you're a batter and, and, and coming back from Tommy John as a batter. Um, it, it's more about, you know, bat speed with the Tommy John coming back, whereas the hand injury, you're talking about gripping a bat and and the feeling when you make contact, how that reverberates through your hands and things along right. those lines. So it, it it makes it a little bit tougher. And so he he honestly feels like this is almost like an easier injury to re- recover from um, for a hitter anyway. Um, and, and and because of that, you're seeing, you know, instant Bryce Harper, whereas when he came back from the thumb injury, we didn't see instant Bryce Harper. We we saw kind of a shell of Bryce Harper until the playoffs. Right. Um, it, with that being said, look, there's always going to be slumps, but I I think that he's at his level. You know, like he's Bryce Harper level right now. Maybe not as much power wise. He might be a little bit behind there, but he's going to get hits. He's going to get on base. He's going to be a catalyst in this lineup, and probably the reason he shouldn't be hitting third. <laughs> Well, let's talk about that because Rob Thompson finally gave into the demands of rightfully impatient fans and the king, Howard Eskin, who held – he's the one journalist in this city who will hold you accountable. So, you know, it actually turned into a bit almost. Like Howard just goes down there and, and does his thing and says, what's with the lineup? He's asking about Schwarber hitting leadoff for the last few days. And finally, Rob makes a, a, a – decision here to change things up and and for one game it, it did provide dividends uh Kyle Schwarber uh, was a disaster in the leadoff spot nobody wanted that at any point nobody really understood why they were doing it other than maybe political considerations um so he drops to fifth yesterday in the finale he gets two hits he, he breaks out of an 0 for 21 slump uh with a single an RBI single and then later in the game he hits a two-run homer his first of the season with a runner on base his first seven of the season have been solo shots. So great. Now everyone feels validated that by moving Kyle Schwarber into the five spot, maybe you can make some of those home runs stand up. You're talking about a team, and I wrote about this yesterday. Uh, they came into yesterday's game with only four home runs with runners in scoring position. We've talked about it on the show a lot. They're not doing big damage. Maybe even the, the, the batting average is sort of middle of the pack. They're not doing enough damage with runners in scoring position. So they get finally a home run with a runner in scoring position. They were dead last coming into yesterday's game. The slugging percentage with runners in scoring position has been dismal. It's at the bottom of the National League. So so you get that that making these decisions and making a decision to put Kyle Schwarber in the middle of this lineup, hopefully you can maximize the efficiency of these home runs. But Oh, that's, oh I'm yeah, sorry. Go ahead. Okay, I'll continue. No, no. Good. Uh, the, the the problem, though, remains that they're not getting anything out of the leadoff spot. You know, you go out last year to bring in Kyle Schwarber. There was a thought that maybe because he has the on-base skills, 
he'll hit leadoff. And he did for the bulk majority of the season. But the, the problem was never really fixed. There was there were flaws with him hitting leadoff. Then this season, you go out and spend $300 million on a shortstop and Trey Turner, and you say, finally, we can rest easy. We know what's happening at the top of the order. And the Phillies, to this point, are still not getting the production that they want out of the leadoff spot. And so we'll dive into some numbers here in a moment, but what, like, what's your initial reaction to what took place yesterday and, and where this is all sort of shaking out at the moment? Well, I kind of, I tweeted it out too, because I, I was like, you know, Oh, what you can Kyle Schwarber can be productive further down the lineup. Who knew? Um, and my, my argument and, and I, you know, I've had this, I've been part of that media gaggle with, with Eskin and, and his little, sideshow but there are more questions that come up it's not just ha Howard is not the only one asking these questions um and I've had a couple I mean I've been one of the guys who's been following up with with Rob about this lineup stuff and one of the things I said to him, well, a couple things I said to him one was even if Schwarber gets hot in the leadoff spot the difference between 2022 and 2023 is you had more power down lineup Last year, you might have a, a, a longer lineup this year, but these guys are, are more, you know, singles and doubles hitters and not power and not home run hitters without without Harper, obviously being Harper up to this point and, and without Hoskins, like, does it make any sense to have your most power, your biggest power hitter leading off games if they're if they're not, there's not going to be people on base if all he's doing is hitting solo home runs. And then secondarily, I mentioned, hey, Twice last year, you guys moved him down from the leadoff spot. Now, granted, it was before Thompson. It was during the Girardi era. But Rob Thompson was the, you know, he was always talked about as the guy who does all the, all the, you know, preparations and all the numbers and sits there. And he was, you know, Joe, the Joe Girardi whisperer. So, I, so obviously, he had to be part of that discussion and part of those decisions. And they twice moved him down from the leadoff spot down. I think they batted him fifth or sixth a couple of uh, uh, over 26 games. Um, the first 13 game set was really effective. He was awesome in that in that spot. And that was late April and early May of 2022. And the second time they did it was right before Girardi was fired. And that one wasn't as successful. And I think that that's when things were like kind of getting strained uh, within the clubhouse and with the with the Phillies and why it what led to the, the managerial change. Uh, Schwarber was not good in those 13 games where he got moved down. Um, but the fact is, is that they had done it with success in the past. And sometimes, it, it, and I know you're not a big, big on the matter where who bats where kind of thing. For this team, but, I am, though. For this yeah. team, I am. Yeah, and, and and I guess my, the only thing that I would say is, and because I tend to understand what you what your argument is under normal circumstances, but I think with with the, in this situation, I think sometimes what happens is you get the you take the pressure off of a guy who's struggling. It's not to say that Kyle Schwarber cannot go back into your leadoff role at some point if you feel like that's where he's ultimately going to be best for you. I don't agree, but if the team agrees, feels like that's the case, you can maybe put him back there. But let's let him let him get back to being Kyle Schwarber before you do, because it's hurting the team with him in struggling in that spot. That's all I was. That that was my argument. And and Rob did give a, a, a non answer, but at least an answer to said we would consider it. And it, here it was less than 48 hours later, they considered it and made the change. So not to say that it was my question that that you know it, it, they had obviously been thinking about it, you know, and he just plays poker. Which, which is a whole other thing that I wanted that, that I wanted to bring up today, Bob. Uh, but at the same time, uh, yeah, you're right. I mean, they needed to make a fit. They needed to do something. They did it for one game. It's worked. But here's the one thing I want to bring up, and I want to send back to you. P put yourself in Rob Thompson's shoes. You start getting asked about this, right? And obviously, within two days, you're, you're going to make a change. So this is something that he's obviously had been thinking about as well. Why not just when you're asked about it? Say something like, you know what, I'm gonna we're, we're gonna stick with this for a little bit just to see if if Kyle, you know, is able to come out of it a little bit. And you know, we know we had success with this last year, but you know what, if it doesn't, if if it continues, if this kind of continues, we might have to make a change. If you do that, if you give that answer, like it it makes the whole big hubbub blow over. But, but sitting there and, and he likes to play cat and mouse and he has fun with it. And I get it. I but, have a I have a question I want to send back to you. Why? I, why go that route? Every now and then I will try to bring in some personal experience uh, to what I 
used to do yeah. um, and, and try to just equate it to what happens at the major league level, which is very hard to do like high school varsity baseball. I always say this is not major league baseball, but I will, I, I do wonder, so you have Rob Thompson, who, you know, the, the story is that he was about to retire and, and that he had had enough. And then he gets this opportunity. They go on this magical ride. Uh, he he turns around the Phillies topper. Everyone loves Philly Rob, the whole deal. Right. And they, they get within two wins of the World Series. And I just wonder if there's a human element or if it's human nature whatsoever to really kind of start to. I don't know. And, and I'm not saying that he. I don't think he gives this off. Like, I still think he's a pretty humble guy, but I do wonder if privately he's like feeling himself a little bit. Like hey, you're here, you're here. I'm a little, I know, like, just trust me because I did it last year. And I, the only reason why I say this is because, you know, I took over um, a, a varsity job head coach in, in 2018 and we were pretty good. Like it was a turnaround. We won like eight or nine games more than we did the previous season. And then the second season we win 20 games. We get within two outs of winning a group championship in South Jersey. I'm inquirer coach of the year. And privately I'm like, damn, I really know what I'm doing. Like I'm, I might not be the smartest guy in the room, but I'm, I'm really damn good at this. Right. And all the while admitting that you have to have the players. Like I, I was the first thing I'd always say, you have to have the talent, but you know, you got to know how to maximize the talent. Right. You know, and then we have the COVID year and then the next year we lose a couple more players and we're not quite as good. And then my final year, we were really bad. And I have to be honest with you. It was very humbling, but I just say all of this to, I, I just, I wonder like if when Rob's like, listen, you know what? You can ask me that question and I get it, but like, I know better than you just like, I'm not giving you anything. Like, I, I, do, I do wonder if there's like a little bit of that in there, but to answer your question. Yeah. I mean, I think he probably should be more upfront. There's no harm in just saying, yeah, we're thinking about it. We're, we might be a couple days away from it. We want to just give this an opportunity to breathe for now, but sure. We understand the viewpoint. The, the other part of this is though, like fans got what they wanted here. And for one game, it worked out. So here we go. Kyle Schwarber, five hole, two hits, gets on base three times. He breaks an 0 for 21. He's coming off a week in which he was 0 for 19 in the leadoff spot. It was a disaster. The Phillies, though, still do not have an, a, a perfect solution for the leadoff spot. And I think you probably want to get into this a little bit about what you think they should do. And I, I have tended to, I believe, if, if you're what you're going to say is what I think you're going to say. I've, I've in the past disagreed with it, but I think I'm starting to come around to it given what we have here. I know a lot of people are like Bryson Stotts, the leadoff hitter. He's hitting almost 300. He, he grinds through a bats. We love Bryson and that's awesome. Right. But I'll just give you this. He's played 20 games after yesterday. Now batting leadoff. He's hitting 261, which isn't horrible. It's fine. He's got a 299 on base percentage in 20 games yeah. of the leadoff hitter. A five and a half percent walk rate. He doesn't drive the ball. There's nothing special about Bryson Stott as a leadoff hitter. Now, is he a better option than Kyle Schwarber for this lineup as currently constructed? I think so. I do. Mm -hmm. But is he like where you where a lot of the fans lose me? It's not move Schwarber down, but it's like okay, Bryson Stock can definitely do this. And just because he hasn't done it through twenty games to the level that they probably need, doesn't mean that he can't adapt and evolve and maybe start drawing some more walks. But there's really nothing about his game right now that says like prototypical leadoff guy. So it's it's an imperfect solution. Yes. Uh, you're a thousand percent right. And I'm not, I, I don't buy into Bryson Stott, at least right now. I think maybe down the road, could he be a good leadoff hitter? Maybe. Um, but I, I don't necessarily think he's the answer either. He's definitely a better option than Schwarber, but I still think that they, they're doing it wrong. Now, what do I equate this to? And I equate this to, and I, it, it's far be it from me to, to throw out a negative tied to Harper considering what what he's done for this team and what he's doing right now which is pretty incredible but I think Harper is is the guy that is causing the lineup construction to be a little bit of a conundrum and that being that he prefers that well he obviously wants to hit three he's okay with hitting four but he really wants to hit three that's where he wants to bat he doesn't like batting one or two and so therefore if you can't put your best player into a spot that maximizes your lineup, 
you have to take a you have to kind of do something else that that works around that right and so i think it's creating this issue the phillies would be fine if harper batted two they would be fine if harper batted one or if you got to keep harper at three then don't be so beholden to the left right left right left right thing yeah because ultimately if i if you said to me right now we're going to keep Harper at three. All you have to do is flip Turner and Stott and bat Stott two and Turner one and keep Harper three and everything else the same as they did yesterday. I would be okay with that too. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like I would be fine with – I don't care that you have back-to-back lefties, and I know that they don't like to do it because you don't want to bring the lefty out of the bullpen and he gets to face three batters and the two of them in a row are left-handed. I I get it, right? I understand that. So, yes, it's more ideal to be able to split your lefties and righties. But that doesn't necessarily mean you have to, you know? I mean, that's the thing. It's like, are you really worried about the possibility of a sixth inning or seventh inning left-handed reliever against the top of your lineup? Like, you know, we saw uh, Schwarber came. The the Red Sox brought in a a lefty out of the pen, and Schwarber put a ball over, you know, 400. 50 feet in the right field yesterday, left on left. Harper's hit lefties before. I mean, Stott's decent against lefties. So what, what does it matter? Like, I mean, like to me, that is, that's the thing that I, I don't think that they're, they're kind of working properly. And if it's just a small tweak and I think you get a better such situation for this team. Yeah. I mean, listen, the bottom line here is, and a lot of this is, is damage done by Kyle Schwarber and being 0 for 19 and failing to draw a walk out of the leadoff spot. Yeah. I mean, it's not even like 0 for 19, but he did walk six times. So the numbers aren't quite as bad. Right. But I mean, they enter yesterday's game, uh, 582 OPS out of the leadoff. That's second worst in major league baseball, 259 on base percentage, worse than the national league out of the leadoff spot. So, yeah. you know, you go out and you make all these investments to finally fix leadoff saying like, this is our one flaw and, and they've just not been able to do it. And not only have they not been able to do it, but it's been the total opposite. It's been a disaster. So how many, games, know, has, how many games has Turner actually let off this year? I think it's just, I one. don't know. I think it's like less than 10, right? Yeah, pretty- I, I, I don't even think it's, I don't even think it might be two. I'm going to yeah, pull it up. Go ahead. You talk. I'll, yeah, I'm going to pull ahead. it up. Look, yeah. I'd be curious to know, but it's funny that you mentioned Trey Turner and I'm okay. Kind of doing the flip flop with him one, two as well. One of the things I wanted to ask you about, it, it's like so weird. Remember if you go back to April and he gets off to a decent start and you look up, he's hitting 330 and you're like, it just feels a little bit hollow. He hasn't really had a lot of big hits. There wasn't any power, a lot of flares. And you kind of go like, eh, okay, like, but it's, it's 330. And I, I sort of feel like that's what's happening again right now. Now he's only hitting 264, but you've seen like some incremental improvement here after a pretty disastrous like two week stretch. He has a hit in every game this month. He's hitting 280 in May. He has an eight-game hitting streak. Like, do you think, and I'll let you, I'm sure you're you're seeing now how many games he's hit in the yeah, leadoff spot, I, but yeah, yeah. do you kind of buy, like, this resurgence of Trey Turner? Like, it, it, it's been solid, but you're, you're still kind of like, all right. Like, I, I, I need to, like, see more impact, I think. Like, it just make a splash, man. I'm not a solo home run when it's 7-3 on Saturday night either. Like, it's time for Trey Turner to like have a game, take one over, win a game for them. Like I'm still waiting for that. Yeah, yeah. And, and by the way, I, I what I I guess in you know my older memory going on me quick, uh, I forgot that he did lead off the first nine games of the year. Yeah, there you go. So I was <laughs> yeah, I had it right. <laughs> so, but no, it's only he's only batted lead off twice in a, twice since April 11th. So twice uh-huh. in a month, right? Yeah. He's only hit one, lead off twice. Um, do I buy it? I, I, I've liked his approach the last two games. Let's put it that way at the plate. It just looks a little bit more like Trey Turner. Like I'm watching these at bats and I'm going, yeah, even on, even on the plays that he's making outs, so I'm like, okay, this is a little bit more Turner. This is a little bit more what you, what I've seen Trey Turner do in the past. Um, I, I can't lock into two games and say that that's all right. He's completely out of it. Right. Um, and like you said, it's an eight, what a, a modest eight game hit streak where the first six of, one of the, for fours, one yeah, for five, and yeah. the first six of those games are not really anything that's really stands out, um, mostly because they were losing them. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm like, I like, I really kind of liked, I, I liked how he looked Saturday again, I'm down at the ballpark, so I'm seeing it from a different perspective there. Um, and, and which is not always necessarily the better perspective because you're, yeah. 
you're you're kind of behind the plate and up. So you're, you're I mean, you're you don't really can't really tell what the pitches are. Um, you could just tell if it's off speed or if it's a fastball. You don't you don't know where the location is unless you watch the replay on TV. But you know, watching yesterday, um, I, I kind of liked it as well because again, he, he worked a walk yesterday. Um, I thought his 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 hit yesterday was a nice hit, right back through the middle. I, so I kind of I kind of like the approach a little bit over two games, and you say okay, maybe. So so that's where I'm at with that. I'm like, I'm I'm a little bit on that on that fence, like. Maybe he's coming out of it right now, um, but it, we got to see a little bit more going forward. And I agree with you; he has not had a game where he's been the best player in the game. Yeah. He just hasn't. I mean, even early in the season, as you go back, as I go back and looking, I go, like, "Oh yeah, I forgot that he let off all those games." And he had a three-hit game against the Marlins on April 10th. That was the 15 to three game. Right. So he, it's not like he was the difference maker in that game. He didn't even, I think he had one RBI. And then he had a three hit game against the Reds that they, in the game, they won 14 to three. Okay. So that, that game was another one. It was like, okay, well, the whole team hit that game. And again, he only had one, one RBI. And the only other game that he had three hits in was the White Sox. Um, uh, the game that they won five to two. Um, and he had a double. And a home run. So that was like yeah, the one game where you, game. yeah, that's the one game where it was like, okay, that was a good Trey Turner game. Everything else is just kind of like blended into the background. I think on the on the positive note, it's it's like this fact that he hasn't gotten it yet. Like he's not there, but he's still hitting two sixty five, and he's been able to piece together prolonged hitting streaks. And even when everything's not exactly lining up for him, he's still finding a way to be fine. It's not like yeah. a a total dumpster fire where like this guy's hitting, uh, you know, buck 95 and right. he's not doing anything for you. But I've just been, I'm like waiting for the Phillies to unlock this. And it's, it's like just more impact on the game, more pressure on defenses, more stolen bases, more first to thirds, more like there's just, there's so much more that this player can do. And like, I'm not trying to rail against them or rail on them or anything, but it just, I know there's more there, and I'm just waiting to see it. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you, Bob. I, I agree with you. And I think it's it, – look, I, I think that the fact that he's able to tread water when he's struggling is indicative of the kind of player that he is. That you know, Even when – like you see the difference, right? When, when, when Schwarber's in a rut, he's in a rut. But Turner is – and we have, we've been critical because he hasn't been what we expected so far. But you look at the numbers and say, okay, well, he's at least – able to figure it out enough to, to kind of still be okay. Right. And, and so therefore you sit there and say, once he gets hot and he will get hot because he's that kind of player, it's going to be really good. So that's right. why I don't, that's why I'm not ready to, to kill Trey Turner just yet. I, yeah. You get frustrated in the moment. Right. And you think about it, but I think on the, on the whole, I think we're going to see a little bit better Trey Turner. Well, listen, we're 33 minutes into this show. And we haven't even talked about the pitching. (laughs) We haven't addressed probably the the Phillies' biggest issue because, in my (laughs) opinion, though, the lineup is certainly worth the conversation right now. Uh, The Phillies have to figure out their starting pitching. Now, they get a a nice bump yesterday from Taiwan Walker, who his previous two outings, there was the arm issue against Seattle. He's taken out of the game early, says he's okay, comes back against the Dodgers last Monday night, and was a disaster. Just a horrible start to the point where you would almost say he's been the Phillies, in my opinion, and this is with Bailey Falter as part of the picture, the most concerning part of the Phillies starting rotation, I think up until yesterday had been Taiwan Walker. And I know that there are arguments that you could make for Aaron Nola, Bailey Falter. Like, I get all that, but he had been very disappointing in my view. Uh, and so you get him yesterday and it's not that he just goes six innings, only gives up three hits, one run, six strikeouts, no walks. First time this season, he didn't walk a batter. His previous starts, he had walked Mm -hmm. at least two batters in every game. So it was nice to see him really kind of stay in the zone and be effective, more splitters, all that. But he also did it against a Boston lineup that came in over its previous eight games, averaging seven and a half runs per game. So it's not like he did it against the Reds or the Rockies. He did it against a good lineup that had been hot. So that's really encouraging, in my opinion. Now, I, I need to see it like three more times, I think, before I really believe it. Because we, he had a couple – about three, four starts ago he, against the White Sox, he was decent. But he hasn't been able to string together consistently effective starts, and that's going to be the next step for him. But given where he had been and, and how desperately they needed that start yesterday, very, very encouraging development. 
Yeah, and it was really they really just simplified. Caleb um really just simplified his approach to pitching that game yesterday. They basically, you know, Walker has got somewhere in the neighborhood of seven different pitches that he throws that or that he can throw. He doesn't usually use all seven in a game, right? But he 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 does use about five in a game. And they've got to the point where it was just like, okay, here's here's what you're going to do. You're either going to throw a four seam fastball or a sinker, right? So you're, that's your that's your speed pitch, and then you're going to th- you're going to throw a splitter, and that's it. Those other pitches, they just I think he threw four n- non fastball splitters yesterday out of all of his pitches. The rest were those. That's it. That's all he threw. And look at the effectiveness that he had. And so it was a matter of. The, he, I guess those are the pitches he feels most confident in getting strikes on. And so, therefore, you, you, if you fill the zone, if you if you pound the zone with, with strikes, you're going to get some swing and miss. And that splitter was incredibly effective um, yesterday. And so it, they really just kind of simplified his game. And they may have to do that, like you said, a couple more times. And we, we talked about this a little bit before this start where we were talking about how concerning – walker has been and you sit there and say you know how much longer can you endure this and i and i I remember i think i said you you, you know i three or four more starts and then and then you got to start to wonder if this was a if this was a bad choice um so it was yes it was really encouraging to get that first start looking like that um you know what's interesting Uh, he's he's not giving up a lot of hits he gave us home runs. Yes, he's given up too many home runs. But other than that, teams aren't really hitting him. Right. It's been the walks and the home runs that have hurt him. So if you can if you can cut down on the walks, which he did yesterday with zero, that's fantastic, right? And you can limit home runs. He did give up one yesterday. It's now that's eight that he's given up already. It wasn't rest- cheap either. No, <laughs> it was not. No, it was cheap- not. It was one of those ones. I had yeah. my head down and I heard it and I just looked up and said, over which wall did that ball go? Like, <laughs> you, knew, you, you knew it right away. Yeah, exactly. Tristan Koss has really got a hold of that one. But um, but yeah, but if you if you could limit the home runs and limit the walks, the rest of his stuff, when you look at his numbers, it plays out and says that's a that's a quality middle rotation arm. Yeah. That's so that's what's gotta be more consistent and be fixed. If Walker can get back to that and, and controlling that, then I'm then I'm not worried about him. And that's why I know you, you had a tweet that you put out, and I want you to talk about it. And, and that's where I I will I will only partially agree with you, assuming Walker can do things like he did yesterday. Does not per- as good as he was yesterday all the time? But if he could be more consistent like that, yes, like he was yesterday, I'll only agree with half your tweet. So go ahead. Yeah, I mean, so obviously I send out a tweet and it's exactly what the doctor ordered because then you finally get that start out of Taiwan Walker. But on Saturday night, I'm watching Bailey Falter implode in the fourth inning. I said, you know, this team needs two more starting pitchers if they want to get serious. If like they want to be serious about contending, winning a championship, they need two more starting pitchers. And, you know, part of the reason I say that is just because there's so much uncertainty with what you're getting out of pretty much everyone right now. But I would even include... Like, listen, I'm not saying that anyone that they acquire or bring in or change up would in any way, shape or form replace Aaron Nola or Zach Wheeler. But I just think because of the uncertainty, like you need two more really good options to to have in the mix here. Now, maybe, maybe Andrew Painter is one of them. I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe Mick Abel, who's thrown the ball very well early on here. Uh, if he does it consistently enough for another couple months, maybe you start to look at him and the, the later this year I I don't think so I really don't like because for me again it's not about is this guy a three or four or five can you piece together a functional rotation I'm talking about a championship rotation that can go in on the road again and beat the Braves and go out to Los Angeles later this year and beat the Dodgers in a key game beat the Astros of the world like that's what I'm talking about here and so not knowing what what Taiwan Walker's trajectory is at this point and Bailey Falter being what he has been now through six, seven starts, whatever it's been. I just say like, you need two. Um, Maybe Walker is one. Maybe he is one of them. Maybe like, maybe he eliminates that need. But Bailey Falter, like Anthony, I just can't, I got to be honest with you. Like I I try to be uh, diplomatic on this show. Like we're down there. We have access, you know, you want to cultivate working 
relationships with players and you, you don't want to be unfairly critical. Like I, I think Bailey Falter stinks. And I, I just, I don't know how the hell the Phillies can look at this anymore and say like, Let, let's keep doing this. Given that we're three games under 500, we need to catch up. Like, I, I just don't know how much more you can do Bailey Falter. I just don't. Yeah. And, and you know, I started to get a sense Friday, but this is even before, even before the last start, I started to get a sense Friday <clears throat> that they were thinking this internally and it wasn't because anybody, you know, whispered it to me or anything like that. When I'm with my, but when you start to try and pay attention to what they're doing, right? And they talked about Nick Nelson, who is now off the IL. Okay, um, so he was optioned, so he's down in the minors, and he's he's healthy and can and can come up at any point. And they put him on a schedule that wasn't exactly matched up to Falter last week. Right, so you're not saying okay, so it's not the same day, but it matches up to Falter this week, and so the schedule because once they announced that they were going to skip the number five starter because of the two off days this week, and start with Nola and Wheeler tomorrow and Wednesday against Toronto, that Bailey Falter's next spot up would be Friday to start the series in Colorado, and lo and behold, that would be the day Nick Nelson's next scheduled to pitch. Now, all of a sudden, he's on the same calendar day. And so, and they've been stretching him out. They've been th making him throw 85 pitches. He's, you know, and, and, and Thompson says, I still think of him as a long man. And this is the same manager who said, I still think of Alec Bohm as our third baseman and yet has not played third base since. Um, so, when you say those things and you see what's lining up, you could see the Phillies had been thinking about this for a bit that we might need to replace Bailey Falter and Nick Nelson might be our best option. The question I don't know the answer to yet. And, and after the start Saturday, Thompson said, as of now, our plan is to that Bailey will make his next start. But the, as of now kind of leaves you <laughs> thinking that he yeah, may not. Right. That was said before Nick Nelson went out and threw five innings, one run baseball, no walks, yeah. five strikeouts. Like he's made three appearances now for Redding. 13 innings pitched. He has 12 strikeouts, no walks. And listen, the fact that we're even talking about Nick Nelson as a, a preferred option at this point to come into the starting rotation, I think lets you know just how bad that turn through the rotation has been. And, you know, but to be fair, to be fair, I mean, Bailey Falter contributed in a significant fashion to the 2022 Phillies. Like they – they got really important starts out of him late last season. And so when I say I think Bailey Falter stinks, you know, to what degree is that fair? I, I don't know. But this version of Bailey Falter stinks, though. I, I will say that. And, <laughs> I mean, like, let's 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 be real about this. I mean, he's yeah. been bad. And I know that they, they, they've scored two runs per game for him. Like, they are not giving him any run support at all. But, I mean, he has been very hittable. He's had blow up innings. It just it has not been good. I mean, opponents are hitting 290 against Bailey Falter this season. It's just not good enough. Yeah. Uh, and the, the other the other the other thing that that makes it easier to consider this switch, I think, for the Phillies is Falter does have an option left. So they can send him down. And maybe that's the thing. You need to get him right, send him down, make a few starts in the minors. Maybe he fixes it. You know, we've seen guys go down get themselves course get themselves course corrected and then come up and, and be better right i mean we've seen it in the past jose alvarado is the you know the poster boy for that right um right. so i mean so it's very possible that that you know bailey falter goes down figures out what's been Ill ailing him this year and maybe he gets back to what he was a season ago when he was a more reliable guy to kind of get you through you know be competitive in games and then turn it over to the bullpen at, you know after five innings maybe that's what he needs and not to say Nick Nelson is the is the long term answer, but he could be the answer right now. That's better than Bailey Falter. And and I, so I don't know. Will Bailey make that start? Will they call up Nick Nelson for that start? Part of me thinks they want to give Falter one more shot against Colorado and see if see what happens. And if it doesn't doesn't go well, then I think Nick Nelson takes the next turn. But I also part of me thinks that they might say we've seen enough and we're going to go to Nick Nelson in that game. Yeah, I just keep looking at it. And, like, there's been, like, all of these qualifiers on his games this season. You know, it's been like, hey, this wasn't a disaster, but it wasn't great. Like, he gets off to a decent enough start against Texas. 
But then, like, you even go back to that White Sox game. Like, I feel like that this is Bailey Falter's season in a nutshell. Like, he he gives up some runs early. He buries them immediately. It was the second game of that double header against Chicago. And then he ends up going seven innings. And you're like, well, I actually did a really good job. Like, you got to credit him for bearing down and giving the Phillies some length. But, like, it's also all after a brush fire in the first inning that immediately sinks him. You go to the, the game Saturday night, and you're like, man, the first time through the order – three shutout innings. Like th- this is the start they needed. And then the fourth inning is just a, an unmitigated disaster. Like there's just always this like roadblock with him and they just can't afford to keep going through the rotation. If this is what's going, you know, if this is what he's going to give them. And, and I don't know, man, like, I don't know if Nick Nelson is the bridge to, to whatever they might do when someone becomes available. I, I have no idea, but they have to get this figured out. You cannot punt. You, you cannot punt on a game every time you go through the rotation right now. And the rest of these guys aren't pitching well enough to, to allow that to happen. Well, let, me, let me flash you back, Bob, to 2021, right? The, when the Phillies were down, going down the stretch and trying to make the playoffs in 2021, what was their ultimate undoing? I mean, other than the fact that they couldn't beat bad teams, right? They were losing games to bad teams. They were Diamondbacks and Pirates and stuff. But really, what was the undoing? They had to pitch a bullpen game every fifth day. They didn't have that last that fifth starter, and you don't you know you say oh it's just the fifth starter. Well, guess what? It it was important enough that it knocked them out of a playoff race two years ago because they didn't have a guy that they could go to. You you can't have that be a situation this this now and stretch over the course of a season. Now we know Dombrowski is going to be the kind of you know he's going to go out and he's going to find a pitcher. Like we know that he's going to go make a trade. You can lock stock and barrel. The Phillies are going to trade for a pitcher before the trade deadline. But like you said, do they need more than one? I'm not there yet, but it's possible. It's possible that they may need more than one. Yeah, like I don't think the solution here is going to be, oh, well, Andrew Painter's uh, progressing nicely. Let's roll the dice and he can slot in. Like there's another guy coming here. Yes. Um, All right. Well, hey, on a positive note, Uh, Matt Strom, who is no longer in the starting rotation, we see him work the final two innings against the Red Sox, picks up his first save with the Phillies. Uh, Listen, I think one of the one of the benefits here of removing him from the rotation is that all of a sudden you start to say, like, well, man, like, are they really going to take this guy out of the starting rotation? We've talked at length about why they're doing that. He doesn't have the innings. He's just not been built up over the last few years to do this. But then all of a sudden you start and look and, and you see like, man, like this, this could be a real weapon out of the bullpen for them. And not just a, a guy that comes in when a starter or when a starter fa- falters early in a game to give you the fifth, sixth and seventh. Like this is a guy that can come in and in key situations and, and be nasty for you. Or at least seemingly like, I don't know how it's all going to play out, but I mean, opponents are hitting 184 against Matt Strom this season and he's thrown over 30 innings. Like this isn't a really small sample size. The whips under one, he's striking out more batters than he ever has in throughout his career. I mean, he struck out the side in the, in the eighth inning yesterday. And you're starting to see a guy that you go, wow. You, you look at Alvarado, you look at Dominguez, I'm not going to mention Kimbrel in this group, but you have some some high upside oh, no. with Soto, and then yeah. all of a sudden you add a guy that could maybe take down anywhere between three and six outs in an appearance, and you say like this is a pretty versatile uh, versatile bullpen. And so even though the numbers grand scheme don't look good, I still remain maybe I'm nuts. Maybe I'm crazy, but I still remain pretty optimistic about what the Phillies have to finish games. They just need some confident starting pitching to get them to that point. Yeah, I, I agree with you a thousand percent. And two things, one on Strom. Um, and it's it, it's funny because, you know, I saw this on Twitter yesterday. I sent it over to you and you used it in your story, which is great. There are four pitchers in Major League Baseball so far this year who've thrown 20 innings and have at least twice as many strikeouts as hits allowed. Matt Strom is one. The other three are Spencer Strider, Shohei Otani, and Jacob DeGrom. I mean, think of that company that, that he's in in that, in that case. 40 strikeouts, he's only allowed 19 hits. That's, that's incredible, right? That's pretty good. My only concern with the Phillies' bullpen right now is they don't seem to have, and I think Dominguez can get back to it, but he hasn't shown it just yet, they don't have a dominant righty in the yeah. past. They, the, all, the three best relievers right now are all left-handed in Alvarado, Str- Soto, and Strom. Brogdon's good, been good, but he you know had a bad outing the last time out, and so it, it kind of skews his numbers a little bit. Uh, Kimbrell's been wildly inconsistent to bad, uh, and Dominguez just isn't doesn't seem right yet. So like that, 
I mean, even a guy like, you know, Andrew Vasquez has been pretty good out of the pen, like a long relief, and he's a lefty. So it's like that. Th there's a little bit of a concern that they're not getting the. the I saw something in the uh, Phillies pregame notes yesterday, like something along the lines with Andrew Vasquez, like 80% of his pitches this season have been sliders. And like, yeah. Opponents are like, like under 200 against it. OPS is terrible. Like the guy's throwing one pitch and he's, he's had some success. Well, he's had success because he's, he's he, the, the, the interesting thing with him is he comes at you from different arm slots. Yeah. Right. Sometimes he does. He can throw over the top. He can throw three quarter. He throws sidearm and everything. You don't know what you're going to get. And he throws that slider out of all different arm slots. And so it kind of, it, they look like it's the same pitch, but they look different as a hitter. So that's kind of a really interesting thing with him. And yeah, good for him. Who knows? But, yeah, absolutely. You know. But All right, well, uh, I, I, I know we have a pretty much, I know, yeah. I know you have a hard stop, right? Yeah. Um, so I'll throw over, a, that's okay. Let's, let's finish it up. Well, I'll throw you a quick one last thing. Um, I'm a, I, I've over time been a guy who, who likes the concept of, of having a little bit more fun in baseball. Right. And uh, you know, uh, I, I'm cool with bat flips. I'm cool with the fact. I'm glad M MLB has allowed these guys to show some personality. They, they changed the cleat rule, right? You don't you don't have to have mac the matching color to the team uniforms. You can have some kind of crazy cleats like Bryce Harper wears sometimes. Um, I don't know if you saw Kike Hernandez wearing those weird teal spikes yesterday. Um, so that's all good stuff. But really, did they need to have a whole big to do about the Matt Strom Cutter Crawford thing? Bob, that this past weekend, like uh, they're doing, and this is, and, and I don't know. I mean, is it is it a thing where you sit there and say they're being the players are being childish, or is it a thing where Major League Baseball needs to say, okay, this is kind of a fun thing, and people talk about it, and there and everybody's, you know, it's a there there's video out there, and everybody's watching. The fanatic was part of it, right? I mean, like, like at what point do we go a little bit too far? I think you just answered your own question. Everybody loved it. Anytime things like that happen, it creates viral content. It's fun for the game. It's a way to market it. So then you come in and you try to police it. And uh, yeah, it's kind of tone deaf. That's all. Yeah. It's a little uh, I, totally with it. I, I think that major league baseball kind of, kind of missed the boat on that, but I'll tell you one other thing that kind of relates to this, where I think fun can maybe go too far. Did you see the play where Wander Franco flipped the ball to himself? On the uh, I knew, ball. you know, and when that I saw one, that, that one, I think is a little amateur. I immediately said, oh, yeah, Anthony's <laughs> going to bring this up. One last thing. Yeah. <laughs> what do you think about Wander Franco? I mean, hey, he made the play right now. I, I, I will tell you this as a as a high school coach. If a player did that, he, he would not be doing it anymore. <laughs> uh, but I mean, I don't know, man. I, I, like I, I, I sometimes I try to check myself like I, I have thoughts. And then I, I like I saw it in real time. I'm like, what, what, what is this guy doing, right? Right. And then you open up, you open up Twitter, and I think a lot of times people, when when you say like that, there's no place for that in the game, or you say like, come on, what is this? This is too far. People say like, you're being ridiculous. Like he made the out. It's fun. People are talking about it. And then I go like, okay, like, am I out of touch? If I become the cranky old guy here, that's one where I kind of just go like, what are we doing? Like, just yeah. get rid of the ball, and make the out. Like. I, I don't know, I, but maybe like I'm willing to admit that maybe I'm becoming a cranky old man. No, but know. I'll tell you why you're not. Because what the 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 negative here is, aside from the fact that it's like a look at me, show offy kind of thing to do, it's you are inspiring other players and especially younger players or young kids who aren't even in the majors to try and do similar things. And are we going to turn Major League Baseball into the Savannah Bananas? I mean, that's really what this is. That's that's the problem. Look, you you crush a ball. You hit it over the fence. You want to do some kind of crazy-ass celebration. Go nuts, man. That's not impacting what's happening on the field. Go crazy. Some 13U right? 13 some 13 <laughs> travel ball coach is going to lose a game this summer uh, at a tournament <laughs> because his shortstop flipped the ball up to himself and then threw it wide of the bag at first. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But I mean, you don't want to, and and you don't want to see that kind of creeping into the professional level where it yeah. it ends up becoming an an error or a mistake, right? I mean, yeah. can you imagine that when that happens. What happens if? Could you? Let's just say, just for fun, let's say you had a player here, you know, Trey Turner, or Bryson Stotts making that play, and throws it away, or or even if he doesn't make an error does it, and then the runner beats the throw to first base, and then that run comes around, and scores, costs you the game. How do you think that the reaction is in Philadelphia? 
That's a I mean, that's a WIP miracle. That's a ratings uh, bonanza. bonanza. Right there. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. So yeah, so that's why I had a problem with it. I'll, only for that reason alone. Okay, all right. I'll let you have that one. No, Thanks. no old man yells at cloud today or any of that stuff. <laughs> all right. Well, uh, thank you for tuning in and uh, listening to the latest episode of Crossed Up. We'll be back on Friday with our full show. Uh, uh, you can follow Anthony at Ant Sam Philly. You can follow the show on Twitter at Up Phillies. You can follow me at Bob Winkel CB. Check us out on Spotify, Twitter, Apple Podcasts, all that good stuff. Check us out on YouTube as well, and we will talk to you soon. <laughs>